All right, next up we have a panel discussion. The name of the panel is the Leaders Panel, Making IoT a Reality. I don't know about you guys, I'm already ready to do um, buzzword shots. So, machine, lang machine learning, machine language, value, and I, 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 I admit, I'm, 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 I'm a culprit on the value one, I probably said that around 20 times, but anyway. Making IoT reality a reality, revolutionizing business models, driving innovation, that would be a shot word, right, innovation. Embracing disruption, mm -hmm. definitely a shot word, disruption, in the future connected world. So we have moderator is Maribel Lopez. She'll be walking up here. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna introduce everybody as, um, as, oh, there she is, Maribel Lopez. Maribel is the founder of Lopez Research and an author. We have Kevin Eggleson, Senior Vice President of Hitachi Social Innovation, the IoT Business Unit. And we have Martin Cotter, he's Vice President of the Internet of Things, Consumer and Healthcare Business Units at ADI. Better get out of the way. Nate Williams, he is the CRO. It's the R, Chief Revenue Officer. All right, he's bringing in the cash, CRO of August Home. And we have Paul Prof Chan, Chan, John, Chan. Jeez, I knew I was gonna blow that. All right, Paul is the Chief Privacy Officer and Vice President at ADT, not to be confused with ADI. So, Maribel, take it away. Well, you've had the official introduction of everybody's name and title, but I thought it might be nice to hear a little bit about how did you enter the world of IoT? So why don't we start with Kevin and work this way? <laughs> so, so Maribel asked me that question about two seconds ago. And you know how you get a job and you don't know how you got it. I got it because Jack, the CEO, asked me to do it. I needed a job because I was moving back from Hong Kong, running Asia Pacific, and we saw at Hitachi this gigantic opportunity and need in IoT, and I just got lucky. Excellent. So, thank you, Marvel. I'm another lucky one. Um, I think uh, I come from ADI, which is all about sensing and sensor processing. And when you look at uh, where the insight into the sensor and the measurement takes you, adding some capability like cloud processing really lets it stretch into a new space. So, that's how I ended up here. How do we put the two together to make a, a bigger uh, outcome? Yeah, sure. Ten years ago, I was asked by Intel Capital to perform due diligence on a startup company backed by Kleiner Perkins called iControl. And I was recently out of business school. My, my passion had been the intersection of media and technology, gaming and, and Hollywood. And so as I started to research this connected home market and saw this amazing opportunity, I uh, got addicted and ended up leaving Intel and running a company called For Home that was backed by Verizon and ultimately acquired by Motorola. I remember it well. <laughs> Paul? Uh, I had good fortune. I, I came to ADT uh, several years ago uh, and I came from a business background. I was in healthcare. I was not the chief privacy officer at my previous, employee, at my previous employer, but I was certified in privacy, but I was a business guy. And so when I showed up at ADT uh, for government affairs and to build out the policy arm so that we could work on policy and IoT and good business policy, I was asked to join the innovation team because I was a business guy who understood privacy and maybe I could get two sides of the house to talk to each other. Uh, and I, I jumped at that chance. It's been a blast and I'm glad I'm here. So I started my career at Motorola and did all things mobile for a while. And went to a couple of research firms and then started my own, and then all good mobile analysts became IoT analysts after the, uh, <laughs> we moved from M to M and now we're into IoT. So here we are today, and I think it, we've had a lot of discussion about the hype. You know, I, I think Nate and I were talking about this concept of IoT becoming the bell of the ball last year at CES, and now I think we're in a bit more of the reality, but I thought it might be good to start by talking about what's working in IoT today. <laughs> Who'd like to start with that? 
I'll make a couple of comments. I, I think, um, you know, we as uh, participants in this market, all of us, uh, we hype it, right? And you've seen it in our presentations, you know, up, and, up until now. Everything's measured in billions and trillions. You don't measure anything in millions now. Uh, but the, the reality is catching up with the hype, in my opinion. Uh, it is certainly like any trend, a little overhyped, but reality is catching up. And I think it's catching up in those areas like Jack mentioned, that dark and dirty, big and boring industrial areas where we're seeing real reality of applications, tremendous financial benefit to companies, productivity benefits. Those are good examples, I think. Yeah, I think, I think Kevin makes a great point. When, when I look at the past 10 years at IoT, in 2006 at CES, most folks that were in the consumer side of smart home had a small booth in the South Hall of CES. No analysts were covering the South Hall. Uh, venture capitalists would come in and say, I have a control for, you know, a Crestron system, how's this different? And if we look at last year, I wrote something for GigaOM, we had reached sort of the apex of IoT. In the past year, we've seen VR and AR drones, bots take off. But I think if we look fundamentally over the last decade of innovation, the technologists here in this room have a lot to be proud of. We've built a, a strong baseline. I, I come to three things I think are so fundamental for success of IoT. So first is if we look at reliability. Tech X10, other technologies from 10 years ago, were not very reliable. Now we have some of the largest silicon players in, in the world. Folks, Intel, Qualcomm, Broadcom, a whole variety of folks that are building out with Moore's Law, amazing technologies, extremely reliable. If you have a state condition that's being sent from an IoT device to a cloud, it gets there. So that's part one. Second is in terms of affordability. So again, I think we're in the early stages of driving down cost and scale, but if we look at the accessibility of some of these products, both on commercial and in consumer, we're seeing great progress. Now one thing I would challenge folks in the audience, and this is some part of my mandate at August, is we have to be more creative on business models. We can't just put a product out there in retail or in the consumer market and expect it's going to sell. We have to innovate. We have to think about ways to innovate, whether it's using data, subsidies, insurance, et cetera. And the most important part, the reason why at August we've spent a lot of time, is usability. Clayton Christensen from Harvard talked about, you hire a product to do a job. We have to meet and exceed the bar for these products. If I'm asking you to put an August product in your home, you have to be comfortable that experience out of the box and runtime is world class. And until we get to that point, you're going to see more than 50% of U.S. households that don't have smart home technology. Yeah, so, so um, when you look at the hype, I think there was a huge amount of hype. And you look at markets that adopt consumer early adopters as are typical. It takes a while for other markets like industrial or healthcare to adopt. There are lots of barriers. Uh, I think what's interesting about it is we're seeing some resolution to those barriers, whether it's uh, trusted data, instead of discarding 80% of the data, you get to use it now in a way that makes an impact to the problem. So I think uh, we're seeing a second wave of IoT happening, where it's much more impactful problems. It's much more uh, the things that will make a difference to an industry, whether it's smart home, smart city, or even a healthcare application. So I think uh, that's a change from a year or two ago. Of course, the fitness and consumer space was a quick adopter, generated this picture of 50 billion connected devices. But I think there's a second wave that needs analytics, it needs a lot more insight into the solution before it really solves that problem. So I think uh, the exciting times are to come. I like that, the exciting times are to come. So Nate, you started to touch on this, and that's the concept of, you know, we are here to talk about what's going on with business models, what's going on with innovation. So when you think about IoT, how do you see IoT changing industries and organizations? We can take that from your client side, and then maybe we can circle back to how are you thinking about business models today as a result of IoT? In, in terms of business models, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, you know. There's a lot of talk about different business models. Uh, a lot of things there to do with give away everything for free and monetize it sometime in the distant future. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the truth of it is there will be a mix of different business models that will be adopted. Um, you can see industries, a um, simple one to think about is healthcare. Uh, you've got 60% uh, of hospitals beds associated with top uh, five diseases. As the population doubles over 65 by 2035, a lot of numbers there, 
um, then you're going to see that expense of healthcare, which is 18% of GDP now, it can't double, right? So uh, there needs to be a different approach. And, and for that to happen, all the people in the ecosystem have to change. Uh, so I think uh, that's just starting. We, you know, there's a security aspect to it. There's a uh, quality of care aspect to it. You can take each industry and you'll plot a timeline of adoption, I think. Yeah, I, think, I think those are good comments, and, and one of the things that we've noticed, you know, we're at Itachi, we're a large industrial conglomerate. We discovered we were in the IoT business with, before IoT existed, uh, and, and, and what we saw with <laughs> IoT, yeah, yeah. what we saw with IoT was that it truly did enable new business models so that we could move from selling an energy thing or a transportation thing to providing either a shared benefit model yeah. where you do, we have a, like an energy savings as a service model for large, uh, large enterprises. We have transportation, rail transport as a service, as an application. You can't do that without IoT. So, but is that where it starts or does it start with something where you are trying to gather data and then you end up moving into Yeah, it starts with that, again, that big and boring stuff of predictive preventive maintenance. Just trying to run the things better and then you say, wait, I know how to control and manage these things. Therefore, if I'm willing to make the big investment in, in a more everything as a service model, I'm now unable to do that. And I think, Nate, you have similar applications in your... Yeah, I just look back and, and look at the smart meters. We went from you know, traditional physical meters that somebody would have to go in your backyard, possibly get bit by a dog. Then they went to AMR, automated meter reading, where they could drive through the neighborhood in the van and take the meter readings. Now we're in a full AMI structure with Silver Spring and other folks innovating there where you don't even have to leave your office. And I look at that adoption where consumers got the benefit of a reduced bill, but they got the benefit of not having to build out so much grid infrastructure. One thing that we talked about that you know, I'm really excited about from an August perspective, um, we've partnered with some of the leading on-demand companies, folks like Postmates and Sears that does 13 million visits to US households each year. We, we see opportunity of reducing a lot of friction that happens at that front door. So just a couple stats that I thought were interesting. Between Black Friday and Christmas of last year, 954 million packages were delivered in the US. Hmm. And last year, in 2015, 26 million of those packages were delivered. So if you start thinking about the high cost of delivery and the fact that most homes are a lot more porous in terms of you know, they have dog walkers, they have deliveries coming to the home. So I see opportunities there. The other stolen thing I would- packages, it was a 26 million It was package. 26 million that were stolen. And I look at something, uh, ADT is a partner and we like ADT a lot. Uh, one area that I think they've done an awesome job innovating that was announced at CES is the ADT Canopy Project. So traditionally, only 25% of US households have had, you know, recurring monthly uh, security, RMR. The 75% have not been there. And so ADT announced a program by which some of these connected devices will have the ability to be on demand. And I think that's a really compelling value proposition for folks who may go on vacation, who may have a second home, et cetera. So he stole your value proposition. He did, but- Do you have another? Keep him talking. Well, I think it, uh, <laughs> it speaks and even leverages the first question about what's working in, in cons certainly consumer IoT and I think also in health. And it, it goes out to answer a lot of questions, but the systems are working, the devices are working, mm -hmm. the, the, supporting, the supporting structure of how innovators talk to uh, product developers who work with those who, who manage consumer protections, who manage regulations, all of that is really beginning to work. Um, and, it, and there's a helpful voice across all these things that bring, I think, really good solutions. And as there's these multitude of products that are being developed, different um, and later on uh, this afternoon, I'm going to show a little bit about our view as to w all the, the product universe, but it's an exciting time that doesn't necessarily mean it's about head-to-head -head competition. It's about leveraging that with new partners, and, and I think new partnership ideas and innovations around that, finding the win-wins for partners, mm. that is all working. Uh, it may, in many, oftentimes it's small, but it, it's working and it has great promise. So is this the type of thing where when we're thinking about IoT and we're thinking about it being an ecosystem, um, what's important to prepare yourself for that? Do you have to have an API SDK structure? or How do you think about making those partnerships and connections work? Yeah, well, oh, go ahead. Um, I think on the, um, the body of uh, users that are 
uh, entering to the space. There are so many companies with fresh ideas and new ways to do things that ease of use has got to be part of what you do. So uh, that's certainly a big focus for us. And I think I like the, uh, the point on uh, partners. You know, I mean, I don't think any one company can do this all themselves. Mm -hmm. It has to be a case that even your customer for the industrial case, it's pretty complicated. Most of the greenfield sites in industry, you can do a lot of new things, you know, new machines, new things. When you talk about most of uh, industry smart machine is an established base of machines that don't talk to each other, right? So to bring instrumentation to keep the uptime on that machine is a much tougher problem, right? So I think uh, collaboration with a small company who will instrument that brownfield site uh, is very typical of how it will evolve and trying those types of things. So I think it is a, going to be a collaboration amongst a lot of different partners. Yeah, my, my perspective is one of the more dangerous behaviors I've seen in IoT past couple of years has been a winner take all dynamic. I don't believe that's the way the web was structured and how it came to be. I don't think that's going to work for Internet of Things. And so I agree. Um, there are companies who specialize in building blocks, the core tenants of connectivity for the devices. We're going to see major players emerge that, that operate on the analytics layer and the security layer. And I think the big challenge for folks that make decisions regarding IoT is what is the core competency of your business? What is the objective that you have to partner up to get? If it's a large Fortune 1000 hardware company that's going to have connected devices, that's where they could work with in a Hitachi or an IBM or GE to help in that process. So one of the more dangerous subjects is where you go in there and you underestimate how hard this is to do. And just one aside from the consumer space, it's always great to think of having an IoT device and eventually you'll wow your customers and you may get some recurring revenue. But uh, an example from the wearable side that we talked about was the Nike Fuel Band. Nike traditionally you know, had sporting goods, shorts, sneakers, et cetera. The Fuel Band launched the product. You paid for the product once, but they had the responsibility of keeping that service live for a multitude of years. They probably never thought about that there's 14, 15, 16 different versions of Android that iOS 7 has to be replaced by iOS 8 and eventually iOS 10. They have to stand up an AWS or rack space you know, uh, part. You have to have specific engineers. And so again, our discussion that, uh, that Kevin and I had was really around, I think going into it as business leaders, technologists, is really understanding the business case of what could go right, but planning for some things that may go wrong. Mm. Because the, the worst is where you have five or six engineers that you've hired that drop a work product to your you know, director of engineering and you don't know what to do. I, I actually think this is really interesting because one of the things that um, has been a big change, I remember talking to the CEO of PTC about this, and this mm. was the concept of manufacturing has changed and a product isn't mm. just a physical good anymore. It's a combination of either physical and software or physical software and service. And that changes the economics of what you're building. And to your point, it changes the complexity of what you're building as well. So things you really need to think through and things that you should be actively discussing with other people as you build solutions, what's worked for them, what hasn't, and trying to get some shared experience and learning around that. Um, so you know, Kevin, a question for you. Um, IoT, do we need platforms or something else? <laughs> so, so by last count, there are almost 300 platforms uh, IOT <laughs> platforms, and I, within those are probably sub-platforms, I, I could argue as well. I think we've got enough platforms. Uh, fact is, uh, I think there are, two I no. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> there are two approaches that I, I think large companies, I, certainly I see, and even small companies take, and that is a field of dreams approach. That is, build a platform, and then they'll come, and you just <laughs> wait for folks to show up. Uh, that's proven not to be successful, and uh, we already have examples of, of those failures out there. Um, our approach, and I think the right approach, is you start with use case and solutions. So you start with the city of San Francisco, you start with consumer applications, you start with uh, problems that you think you can uniquely solve. You build the solutions to that, and over time, the common requirements of a platform evolve, and the unique requirements of a solution evolve, and then you can have a platform that facilitates deployment of solutions. I think that's the model for the future. So thinking of it more as a set of reference architectures for use cases. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, I think that's true. I think that you want to start with the problem and then you want, and, and then something that pops to my mind about working as a stakeholder in that group and as a participant and leveraging the comment about knowing what your core competencies are. So right from the get-go, when you're designing that, that you're developing that, that problem set and coming up with solutions, thinking about what you do well, I think you got to leave room for the things you don't do well. Uh, and because that's one of the reasons you'd go engage a partner. One of the challenges is when, when development goes and goes and goes and you didn't leave room. And then we have to pen test something and go back to something we probably could have found um, when we were doing static testing. Right? Um, so I think that's part of, part of this. It's one of the things I think is getting better and better. And we need to do, uh, you know, we need to keep doubling down there. But it does start with what is the problem? What are we trying to solve for? What, is, what are we good at? And how do we factor external uh, needs into that? I mean, maybe to put it in a context, a rhetorical question, what is 1% of market segment share between iOS and Android worth? If you really think about that, right, large mobile platforms, if you look at any major consumer tech brand, Apple, Google, Samsung, Amazon, Microsoft, Sony, et cetera. You look at their vertical stack, they have cloud storage, they have consumer devices, they have VR investments, et cetera. So when you think about what's happening on the network, specifically on the consumer side, we know that phones are replaced every 24 or 36 months. We know TVs are every seven years. What are these 15 to 100 devices that are coming inside the home in the next five years? They're IoT devices, they're connected devices. If that device is predisposed towards an Android or an iOS ecosystem, what does that mean downstream? And so if you unravel part of that mystery, you'll realize why this is so important, how this changes the balance of power potentially between a Verizon and a, and a hardware company, between a, a Comcast and other folks that are in the network. And so again, we're seeing folks that are really focused on having an IoT strategy but what I end up looking at from our perspective is we made a choice at August not to build a platform. We are building a portfolio of products around access control. We care about people, products, and services that enter the home. And we support platforms like ADT, micro, uh, HomeKit, um, and works with Nest and others. But I think that decision making as an entrepreneur or as a product person to say, here's what I'm not going to do. Uh, one of the biggest problems when you and I worked uh, together on a Verizon project years ago is knowing when to say no and, and having some barriers of what you're not going to do. I think some of the most successful folks from Elon Musk, Mark Andreessen and others, they know when to say that's enough. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think there's this concept of a mission and what's your mission that you're trying to accomplish with your products and getting rid of every, everything that is not core to that mm -hmm. mission and working with partners to do that. But that's really hard, particularly when you're small and you want to try to build something that's compelling. And particularly when you're in a market that's very dynamic. We're still in a very dynamic market. Um, one of the dynamic natures and issues that we've had in discussing IoT has been around security. And I was wondering if the panel would like to talk about just some of the considerations and security that you should be thinking about uh, as you're either buying or building services. And is it getting any better? So, um, in you terms must of talk about this a lot. In security, the we talk about quite a lot. Uh, and particularly, I think uh, I would agree very much with uh, what Kevin said about the value in, in IoT for us is about the quality of the problem that you solve. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the ability to connect to a cloud service is an extra capability. You, you still need the domain expertise of the problem. And any platform we would build has got to be within that problem statement. Uh, similarly for security, right? different uh, problems have different security needs. If you take uh, a breach in security for uh, a big plant, it's uh, unconscionable. So normally they will keep that network separate. Um, so you don't have the, the chance of a breach. If it's a healthcare application, it's a HEPA compliant uh, device and you have to be careful about what you claim is the outcome. So it's about securing the data to what is measuring, but even securing the data to the person that's being measured. So the security level obviously goes to keep the data intact from sensor to cloud, but even keep it intact to what's being measured. So I think there, the levels of security are still evolving, getting right down to the physical layer and even down to the data itself. So I think that, that actually opens up lots of interesting opportunities. 
I'm, I'm personally excited about the fact that we can actually secure right down to the data chip layer. So start with when you have new devices that they can have a some level of security right out of the gate. So mm. I think that's been a really good uh, evolution in the IoT space. So um, where's the money in IoT? Is it in industrial or is it in consumer? <laughs> <laughs> so clearly the shiniest thing is consumer. <laughs> a lot of cool stuff, we all do it, right? Shiny things. Yeah, we all are wearing and carrying and using our shiny things. The money today is certainly being made on the industrial side. I think that's where the big market uh, opportunity is. However, they're coming together. So, you know, any major, um, you know, app or solution problem area that you can think of, healthcare, energy, transportation, smart city, the consumer side of it is super important data inputs to this. And so they come together, and they're coming together today. I mean, Nate, you and I were talking about Strava. We're religious Strava users, and what's happening there? So maybe you can talk about those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, I th the, the first thing is whether it's consumer or enterprise, if you were pitching a venture capitalist now, they're not gonna ding you based on it being too small of a market. It's a big enough market on both <laughs> sides. Um, consumer clearly has more beta risk. Obviously, you're more likely to fail. It's harder competition. Um, enterprise, in my mind, is a 10x opportunity. It's just every single industry, from healthcare to transportation, uh, food services, jet engines, will be completely transformed by IoT. And I think that's so massive. But we talked about Strava as this idea of you get the benefit from a service, but then there's some societal good. So in this case, Strava is an app that allows you to track uh, your athletic performance, cycling, running, et cetera. We're both active cyclists. One of the things that we thought was really cool is they started sharing that data in an anonymous way with some cities, including Portland and San Francisco. So here I am really focused on staying fit so I can race, but at the same time, San Francisco's getting some data that allows them to say, those are the routes where the cyclists are at. Maybe we need bike lanes there. That's how we prioritize. And I see those types of uh, partnerships being very successful. One other thing I can say from August is we partnered with Liberty Mutual. So in that case, um, starting to understand how people think about a safe and smart home, how often they, they can arm an ADT security system, those are the things that will really help. Um, the key when we talk about security, just one last thing on that is what type of security? Is it data security? Is it denial of service, et cetera? Uh, we don't have enough time on this panel to go through that. but. Some of the best opportunities for entrepreneurs right now is in Internet of Things of security. Mm -hmm. There are just amazing teams out there that can look at these devices and make them safe and secure, and I think it's a completely unmet opportunity right now. Paul, how are you thinking about how IoT is changing your business at ADT? I mean, you have been around for a while. Uh, you then had to go through the whole wireless security system from Wired. How is IoT changing the business? It's a really exciting time. Um, the, the ADT's been around for more than a century, traditional security business, but the IoT in the last number of years has been exploding, and that's what, talking about solution sets for customers, what do they want to solve for? It's what the vast majority of our customers are asking us for now. Where uh, our smart home application, it's something we traditionally have called Pulse. Our Pulse system accounts for uh, three out of four new sales. Uh, where folks are asking for one of the levels of that type of control. So it, it's very exciting. And when you think about the number of devices and partners and things, it's, it's also very exciting. And so it, um, it is really, to the title of this talk, it, it is, it's a positive disruption. And, and trying to figure out what that customer wants and, and to then match it with our traditional values that we bring of security, comfort, peace of mind, it's very exciting for us. Okay, so we have a few minutes left, and I thought it would be good for the panel to provide one or two pieces of advice if you are, the, in the context of if you are actually purchasing an IoT solution, a piece of advice, and if you're selling an IoT solution, a piece of advice. Who'd like to start? Hmm. I can start. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> So, you know, I'm at the large industrial side of this, so I'm sort of speaking to any of you out there, there, but it creates opportunities for the rest of you as well. So I think that we as the, the big players in this IoT space need to put our money where our mouths are. You know, we're talking a lot about all these trillions and billions of benefits and the difference that we can make. We need to put our money where our mouths are and invest. 
Uh, it takes investment to put together integrated solutions, and it takes investment to deliver on these everything as a service business models. If we don't do that, we haven't fulfilled what I think is an obligation to make this IoT market much bigger, much faster. And lastly, we realized early on we can't do it alone. Uh, even as big as we are, and I know that our, our competitors feel the same way, we're, we have to partner with both small companies and with our frenemies in the business on an open approach, uh, even go, going so far as open source approach to this problem. So, uh, you know, that's my advice to the team. Yeah, I think uh, it would be similar to that. You know, we, we're in the industry, industrial space as well. Um, a lot of difficult problems. So having something that is a trusted piece of data, that you really know the quality of the data, that that can go and get the right insight in terms of what you're going to generate as an output. Uh, having a lot of uh, false positives is much more costly than not instrumenting at all. So uh, you know, we're finding the some of these solutions that aren't properly road tested, uh, that takes investment, uh, but it also takes uh, a need to have the solution right to that end result and know that that's going to generate the right saving. So I think uh, you're going to see a lot of companies who are trying these things without having the proper road test done fail. Um, whereas uh, having the approach to it that gets you right to that proof, I think is going to make the difference. I think that's true in most industries. I want to save some time for Paul, so I'll go fast. I think first is utilizing the resources. This industry that we're in, everyone here in the audience and on the stage, this is an awesome industry with great, passionate people. And really take advantage of resources. There's so many great folks from Maribel, Michael Wolf, Stacy Higginbotham. There's a ton of information out there already around IoT. So I think being a student of the game is important. I think the second part is far too many people write their business case of when it all goes right and it never goes all right. So double check your numbers, double check your business logic, and plan for the case where it goes wrong. The product takes a year longer, you make half as much revenue, your return rate's higher, et cetera. Part three is uh, just partner up. You cannot go at it alone. There's just too much complexity at every stack layer, analytics, security, et cetera. And lastly, uh, I, I really want to reinforce, it's not winner take all. We're building a business. We're raising the water level. It's too early to really engage in head-to-head -head combat of who's going to win everything. I think we win when consumers and enterprises are blown away by these products and services. When I hear somebody talk about a great experience they had with an Apple product, or they love their Tesla or Sonos, that's the stuff that excites me. And so the big opportunity is how I can wow that customer every day. I think I would answer uh, with the phrase of user experience for both those situations, whether you're buying and selling. If, if you're selling something, uh, particularly if you're selling it to somebody like ADT, we're interested in the user's experience because we want them to, when they're using their ADT Pulse system or they're using our Canopy service, to want to keep using it. Because one, it, you, know, you, you understand all the obvious reasons for that including helping us retain people for the long term. We're interested in customers using the ADT platform for a long, long time. You know, when, and um, if you're buying something, what is your user experience? And how is, it, how is the connectivity? How is, how is the product function? How, what can, when, you, when you do a little bit deeper of a dive into it, um, you know, what, is, what is the structure around it? What's your experience going to be like so you want to stay that long? Um, I think user experience and solving problems for people so they engage with these systems, so they incorporate them into their lives is the real beginning of everything. Because from that, we get satisfied customers, we get data, we get the ability to innovate further. Um, so that would be how I answer. Excellent. So for me, I would say if you're a smaller startup, think about the two or three pivots that you might have to make similar to uh, what Nate said. Uh, I think if you are embracing these solutions, it's important to have something that you can start with a quick win and build on it, because I think you need to get the money for the investment, and you need to demonstrate value with anything that you're doing. So with that, I would like to thank the, t the panel for their time and attention. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Good job, guys. Good job.
Yeah, I like that because it had, it kind of had the consumer angle, it had the industrial angle, it had the commercial angle. So we're going for not lunch, we're going for brunch. And because it's brunch, there's mimosas. And because it's brunch and there's mimosas, it's going to be at the Hyatt Pool Terrace, or Terrace. So just go out these doors, around, it's going to be back here, and meet back in this same place at 1220 for our next presentation. Thanks. <laughs>